This is KGW News at Sunrise. If you need help cleaning up debris from the wildfires, today is the deadline to request it. Our Bryant Clerkley joins us to break down the process and explains the options homeowners have moving forward. Plus, they're a bit smaller than, say, your typical home, but we also know good things can come in small packages. So this morning, we'll highlight the Portland business that's creating energy efficient homes that can also save you some money. And we hear from one of the people who made this quilt mm. stitched together for America's bicentennial. She's frustrated that protesters damaged it during last weekend's riots. So coming up, we'll take a closer look at the history behind that quilt. It is a Friday morning here on Sunrise. A quick Friday morning roll call. Nina, absent. Brenda, here. present. <laughs> and Rodney Hill, here and ready to go this morning. <laughs> good morning. We have a pretty good day coming up. We're not going to see that beautiful deep blue sky that we had yesterday. We are starting off with cool temps, uh, 46 in downtown. And by the way, these temperatures, generally low to mid 40s, exactly Average, if you will, for this time of the year, there's Salem and Kaiser at 42. Uh, a little bit of fog being reported out in Washington County. Most of us, I think, will start off with sunshine, but we will see increasing cloud cover during the day. 56 at lunchtime, cloudy skies much of the afternoon, potentially, and 64 at 5 p.m. Thank you, Rod. We begin this morning with a group of black Portlanders heading to court. They say they want to show people the type of discrimination they face on a daily basis. We spoke with one of them who says he tried to buy gas for his lawnmower last summer and was denied. Dominique Deweese says the attendant implied that he was going to use that gas to start dumpster fires during a riot. The incident happened last July at Jay's Garage on Southeast 7th and Morrison. Deweese pulled out his cell phone and recorded part of the conversation. He says the attendant told him to go to a different station and Deweese left empty handed. Terrible. I mean, uh, I walk, I walk that neighborhood every day. I live in the Buckman neighborhood. I walk that neighborhood with my, with my daughters every day. Um, and for me to have to explain to them why things like this happen is very difficult. It never feels good. Deweese is filing a $350,000 lawsuit against Jay's Garage, citing racial discrimination. The owner tells KGW he fired the attendant after seeing the video on social media. He said what happened is against company policy, adding, we serve everyone. I feel bad what happened to the guy. It's not who we are, or it's not the way we are, is what he said. Deweese's court case is just one of four lawsuits filed on behalf of black shoppers. We've posted more about the other cases on our website. Just go to KGW.com. This next story involves serious allegations of abuse against a prominent leader in Portland's black community. We're talking about Reverend E.D. Mondanay, who leads the Portland chapter of the NAACP. So this week, the Portland Mercury published a story where several men and women said Mondanay repeatedly abused them sexually, physically, and emotionally in the 1990s and during the first decade of the 2000s. KGW spoke to one of the men who's accusing Mondanay of sexual abuse while he attended his church in Portland. The man didn't want to use his real name publicly, but he did use the name Ray. We had to start seeing him lauded as some great man, some hero, some kind person, and be drugged through our trauma again and again, and to be powerless against him. So there is Mondanay, and he has denied all allegations. He held a Zoom call with reporters yesterday where he didn't take any questions, but he did call the allegations an example of, quote, cancel culture. And despite denying that he abused anyone, Mondanay said he will not be running for re-election to continue leading the local chapter of the NAACP. Today, ballots will start going out in Washington. If you want to register to vote online or by mail, the deadline is coming up on October 26th. In Washington, though, you can also register to vote in person up until 8 p.m. on Election Day. And if you'd like to track your ballot, we've set up an easy way to do that. Just text the word ballot to the number on your screen. It's 503-226-5088. We'll send you a link to the site where you can track your ballot.
Well, we can tell you crews continue to make good progress on Oregon's wild, uh, wildfire lines. So here's where things stand as of this morning with three of the major fires that we've been covering since early last month. We start with the Lionshead Fire in Lynn and Marion counties, which is 46% contained. The Beachy Creek Fire, meanwhile, in Marion County is now 80% contained. And in Clackamas County, the Riverside Fire is now 72% contained. Together, though, those three fires have burned more than 536,000 acres here in Oregon. Today also marks a very important deadline for anyone whose home or business was burned by the wildfires in Oregon. State cleanup crews will be removing hazardous waste from people's properties, but before they can do that, they need the property owner's consent. So we have Brian Clerkley covering this story for us today. Good morning there, Brian. Good morning, Drew. Now, the waste has to be removed before anything can be rebuilt, and this is the first step in the rebuilding process, and this is free to property owners. Now, the form they need is called a right of entry permit. It gives cleanup crews permission to come on your property. The state wants forms sent to the county today, but that is so they can coordinate with contractors. They say they will not turn owners away if the form if the form is sent in letter in a letter. Property owners in Lane, Clackamas, Douglas, Jackson, Klamath, Lincoln, Lynn, and Marion counties qualify. Oregon's Debris Management Task Force is overseeing this effort, and they want to assure property owners that the cost will not be on them. No government agency is going to be um, recouping money from people's insurance that could have otherwise gone towards rebuilding your home. And it's important again to note the forms have to be turned into your county, not the state. And we have a link to all the county's different cleanup programs on our website, KGW.com. Back to you guys. All right, Brian, thank you very much. We do have one more wildfire story for you this morning. The Red Cross has served more than 210,000 meals to wildfire survivors here in Oregon. But now the organization is turning those efforts over to state agencies and local vendors. So starting today, around 2,000 people in those fire affected areas will now rely on community partners and other organizations to get their food. The Oregon Department of Human Services is coordinating all this and they plan to follow the same preparation and delivery schedule that was created by the Red Cross. Earlier this week here on Sunrise, we told you how a quilt honoring historical black figures was stolen from the Oregon Historical Society during Sunday night's riots in downtown Portland. It was recovered, but it's damaged. We talk with Sylvia Gates Carlisle, who helped make the quilt with her mother and other volunteers. She started work on that quilt back in 1973, and she finished it three years later, just before the country's bicentennial. Sylvia is now a doctor down in Southern California, and she says she was stunned to hear what happened. I don't know the who or the why, but I don't know the what. The legacy of the quilt, the legacy of the individuals we're honoring. Sylvia went on to say the people portrayed on the quilt may be gone, but they're certainly not forgotten. The quilt includes Frederick Douglass and Mary Church Terrell, who was one of the first African-American women to earn a college degree. Well, the coronavirus has put a damper on yet another holiday tradition here in Portland. There will be no Peacock Lane Christmas display this year. The organizers cited COVID regulations and a concern for the health and safety of visitors and residents. In December, the Southeast Portland Street would normally be filled with holiday lights and decorations with lines of people in cars touring that display. I was wondering how they would handle things this year on Peacock Lane. Obviously, uh, that's the story I've covered in years past, Rod. And if memory serves me correct, mm. I believe you did a uh, Rod on the Road out there on Peacock Lane at least once. Yeah, I've been out there several times over the years as you have been. Isn't it possible there's at least one person that lives on that road that's going, yippee! I mean, there's a lot of people that come out to see those lights. All right, take a look at uh, the satellite picture. Uh, picking up a little bit of rain up in western uh, Washington this morning. We have uh, generally mostly clear skies right now. Pretty shot of the Tillicum uh, crossing. F uh, 45 is the early temperature. We're going to be looking at probably some upper 30s in some of the spots around the valley this morning. But generally we're running just a couple degrees warmer than 24 hours ago. Salem's in the low 40s. Kelso, good morning, 49. 
So again, there's cloudiness up to our north. Seattle's of 54. We're in the 20s this morning in Baker City and Burns. So the tale of today is we start off with sun and then we get increasing cloud cover. Um, here's Futurecast at 4 p.m. I just think this is way overdoing this. I, th I think odds are overwhelmingly good that Portland will stay dry and Salem will stay dry, including tonight. But there may be some traces of rain bumping up against the mountains more like overnight tonight as that batch of clouds comes rolling through. Uh, here we are tomorrow with those clouds gone. Saturday, the brighter of the two weekend days, 1030 in the morning, and we'll see a partly cloudy day. Now on the seven day, Sunday will be cloudy probably from start to finish and there's a legitimate chance of seeing some rain. It's not a slam dunk. The rain here could stay to our north as well, but we're watching that and then scattered showers in the forecast to start next week. Hmm. Again, today's side right back up into the mid 60s. Drew, I'm never quite sure if that hmm you give me is good, <laughs> bad, whatever. You know what? Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Rod and Brenda. I'm hmm-ing the uh, story that we're going to talk about. Not right now but in about 32 seconds. So get ready. Here we go. Your story first, Brenda. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about <laughs> energy efficient homes. They're great. But what if you could have a house that created all the power you need and more? So we're not talking just energy efficient with this story. We're talking about zero energy. We're going to give you a look inside a zero energy home that does have a lot of perks like a hot tub, even a jukebox. And now here comes the story that had me humming a moment ago. He is a special dog. I think he'd make a good puppy president because of his love of other dogs and his energy. I can't believe I'm about to say this, Brenda Braxton, but we're going to introduce you to the front runner to become the president of the furry states <laughs> of America. I don't know if you're going to stay tuned for that story or despite that story, but either way, I say thank you for staying tuned.